That's it, that's it. Now oh, you've got it together, that's it. Let it go, let it go. Feel it happening like a great ocean gathering you up like the silken shrouds of death. Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. I'm Brad. Folks. La. <laughs> Brad. <laughs> you can't spell Brad without A-D. And it's Brad, A-D, 1972. That's right. Except I'm Brad, A-D, 1979. Dude, I'm Richard, A-D, 1999. 1899. No, I, sh- I shaved a few years off <laughs> Just a few. Just a few. So, <laughs> I, we didn't discuss this before we started recording. We're going to do like a, a big double feature episode. We're not going to split this up into two episodes, right? Yeah, I think it's just one big one. Okay, cool. I don't know why I didn't think to... I ever thought, but whatever. So, folks, we are going to be talking about a subject that I I suspect we have never tackled on this show before, which is Hammer Horror. Mm-hmm. Do you think we've ever done any hammer? I don't think so. I we think, think we we're starting in the right place. Absolutely. <laughs> Folks, we're going to talk about Dracula AD 1972, which was released in 1988. No, it was released in 1972. And then we're going to talk about the satanic rites of Dracula from 1973. When Ted and I talk about the satanic rites, my phone autocorrected to the satanic tires of Dracula. <laughs> so. Oh my god, he definitely went to Tire Kingdom for that shit. Mm-hmm. The only satanic tire place is Tire Kingdom, not our sponsor. <laughs> not tonight, anyway. No, not. We'll, you know, we'll see if we got any of the perfect pancake money left. Uh, the perfect pancake. <laughs> or our, our Snuggy dollars. Who was the who was the mattress folks that uh Casper mattresses Casper mattress the the friendly <laughs> ghostly mattress you were you said on the show you said why do you want to sleep on a Casper mattress you're just sleeping on a ghost <laughs> <laughs> oh boy so yeah folks we're gonna spoil these movies to Hades and uh, and, and all the way to heavens but first of all. Here is a cool little TV intro. The trailer for this movie is exceedingly long and ridiculous. So, of course, Once Upon a Time, Dracula AD 1972 played on a CBS late night movie, and they did a spectacular intro for it. So here is that. Tonight, on the CBS late movie... Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee star as the world's darkest legend resurfaces to terrorize today. His cursed ashes are found, his spirit called from below, and the world is damned. I summoned you! By Dracula. In the modern streets of London, the gothic horror walks again, still thirsty for blood and ready to infect his armies with his curse. You 
should be back in there. Peter Cushing stars with Christopher Lee in Dracula, A.D. 1972. Let's see if I can find a gorgeous VHS cover for this. Boobs. Boobs. Man boobs. La boobs. <laughs> La boobs. That's the French version. Mm-hmm. Stephanie Beecham. Here we go. You know, I wrote a song about about her breast once. <laughs> Are you? Did you really? I sure did. Oh no! <laughs> it was to the tune of uh, it was a Bob Seger song. Uh, I'm not gonna sing it because I know you'll put it in the show. <laughs> <laughs> Me? No uh, way, buddy. I can't remember all the lyrics, but it, the chorus was, and you know we're never going to call it quits, because we all love Stephanie Beecham's kids. <laughs> I'm a huge Stephanie Beecham fan. As you should be. She's incredible. She's so good. I have found the Warner Brothers VHS tape here from 1994, and here is what it says on the back of it. They've been there, done that. London's become a small town for a handful of jaded, psychedelic-era hipsters. But Johnny Alucard has a groovy new way for his pals to get their kicks. A certain ritual will be the living end, he insists. And if you still wonder where Johnny's coming from, try spelling his last name backwards. Mm. Dracula is raised into the modern era in this Hammer Studios shocker that's, quote-unquote, quite well done. By <laughs> Revenge of the Creature Features Movie Guide, the self-described tall, dark, and gruesome, Christopher Lee dons the cape for the sixth time and goes on the make for young blood. As arch-enemies Van Helsing, fellow horror star Peter Cushing, clutches a vial of holy water and edges within throwing distance. <laughs> so not... That does not make me want to watch this. That was the dumbest thing ever. Their harrowing battle royale is not to be missed. In fact, it's the living end. Waka waka. This is why Warner Brothers is now out of business. Mm -hmm. Because they made this tape. Uh, My favorite alternate title for this movie, because, you know, it's got some of those Mm -hmm. flinging around, flung in, in the... (laughs) The country known as Denmark. The title for this movie is The Vampire Hunts Hot Pants. Mm, and in uh, right. in Brazil, it's uh, Dracula No Mundo de Mini Sazia. What is that? I, I thought I translated that one, too. Let's see. <laughs> Dracula in the Miniskirt World. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's mini skirts was going to be one of the titles. UK, the working title was Dracula Chases the Mini Girls, which I think just meant little people. Mm. And in Sweden, it was Dracula's Blood Story. Wow. Yeah, I just find it strange that we never did Hammer. I guess we figured somebody else would do them all. Well, did, did you do a Nashi film with somebody? Uh, yeah, I did uh, Nashi with uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. We did one. We did after being a podcast for like a decade. We finally did one Paul Nashy movie because you know, yeah, Nashy cast got him covered. Sure, absolutely. But uh, I just didn't. I wanted to do Fury of the Wolfman, Nashy's most favoritest movie. He hated doing. Chemotrodes. Chemotrodes. <laughs> Elizabeth loves Chemotrodes. Oh my god, that movie though is ah. Uh, I need, to, I need to fire up that Blu-ray. I still haven't watched it yet. Yeah, I wish I'd gotten it, but I didn't. Well, you sent me your copy of Terror on Tape, so... Apparently. <laughs> Folks, <laughs> last night I thought, well, I'll grab Terror on Tape and read whatever review is in it uh, on the show. And I can't find it. And then I grabbed uh, my copy of Terror on Tape. <laughs> they liked Dracula AD 1972 so much that they didn't include it in the entire book. <laughs> yeah. Maybe and that's why it hit itself. I think they review every other one of Christopher Lee's Dracula movies, but not that one. Man, I just, I could have sworn I'd read about it in there, but apparently not. Apparently not. 
But uh, yeah, we're going to jump into this plot. Um, as I like to say on every show, <laughs> roll that beautiful bean footage. <laughs> Actually, I don't, I haven't said that, but now I said it. Well, you should start saying it. Uh, we get some sweet, sweet voiceover as, uh, you know, we need to be caught up to speed. As uh, Van Helsing, played by good old Peter Cushing, and Dracula, played by good old Vincent Price. Mm. No. Uh, Christopher Lee, they're fighting on a stagecoach, which, that's not the end of a movie. No. That's, this is, this is a climactic battle sequence for mm-hmm. a previous Dracula installment that does not exist. Correct. Because a lot of the movies led into each other up until a point. Yeah, I mean, 1872, the novel of Dracula had not even been written. That was 1897, so they don't even have it historically, (laughs) you know. Damn it! (laughs) Man, I really wish Mary Shelley had gotten her act together. And written it earlier. And written the the book called Dracula. So they're fighting on the stagecoach, and there's a big crash, and, uh... Apparently, vampires are allergic to wheels because Dracula gets stuck on a spoke of a freaking <laughs> wagon wheel. And all I could think of is that horrific uh, death at the beginning of Death Smiles at Murder, where the dude gets impaled and it's so disgusting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, uh, can we get a pig puree to just pour on this poor actor? How many movies that we have covered? in the past, ended up getting nice Blu-ray releases. Um, a lot. It's surprising. A this is a this is a golden age. Like, I know people think streaming is so great, <laughs> but, dude, where the real awesomeness is at is just, like, these companies are finally figuring out what we wanted <laughs> yeah. all these years. <laughs> Movies. It's like, uh... On disc. I mean, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad some companies are going 4K and everything, but dude. Mm-hmm. I am one of those hardcore giallo people. If it's not Italian, if it's not between 1971 and the latter half of 1971, it's not a giallo. No, I'm one of those people that if it's not Suspiria, it's not a giallo. If an American has seen the film. It is no longer a giallo. No, that's true. You're right. I have ruined so many giallo that way. I'm not watching them. So anyway, Dracula gets impaled <laughs> on a wagon wheel. <laughs> and uh, right before he drops dead, uh, Van Helsing manages to stab him even further in the heart area mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. the frickin' uh, the wagon wheel spoke. And uh, then Dracula turns to dust. But then his disciple shows up, uh, who we have to presume is his disciple. This guy was chasing them on his on horseback and caught up to them. And he takes a ring and he takes a little vial of Dracula's ashes. And at Van Helsing's funeral, uh, who I'm calling Laughing Boy, mm. is uh, is there, and he buries the vial of ashes and the ring in the ground. I have a question. Okay. Is that our buddy Alucard that's in old timey times, or is that a different guy? Uh, it's the same actor. Okay. So, but it might not be the same guy. It's like his descendant. Yeah, I think it's... No, his ancestor. Yeah. Whatever. Ancestor. Right. <laughs> However family work. So I've got, I've got some stuff to say about old Christopher Neem. Christopher... Neem. Neem. He's very happy with himself by desecrating the the ground around there. And that's why I called him uh, Laughing Boy. Mm-hmm. And then someone who should have been credited the soundtrack to this movie. The, pers- mm. the personification of music shows up. And we get some funky, funky funk. <laughs> no, we do. Oh my god! Like this, this music by uh, Michael Vickers is is just so distinct. This music is it's not your grandfather's Dracula soundtrack, folks. Nope. Uh, let's see. This guy also worked on 
things I've never heard of. <laughs> he he hmm. he did the soundtrack for The Sandwich Man. <gasps> okay. He did a soundtrack I recognize. Really? It's called The Stud. Oh, but I know what that is. I don't think it's that, The Stud. No. Was it? No. No, this isn't The Stud I was thinking of. This is 1974. The Stud I'm thinking of is 1978 with Joan Collins. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of, too. No, it's different. This is different Stud. Let's, I better move on before I get sucked into The Stud. Yeah, and there's a sequel called The Bitch, right? Which is even worse. <laughs> a bit. <laughs> yes, I covered those in uh, the uh, the Disco of Death movie thon many years ago. And uh, they're a pair of movies, all right. I'm telling you. Woo! But yeah, this funky score, I love it. It's it's just it's so... so it lets you know exactly what you're getting into with this movie. Yes. <laughs> Did you watch that video that I sent you? No, I, I wanted to learn from you. I've not watched it. I said it's my save for later. Yes, 44 seconds. What? The video's 44 seconds? Yeah. Oh, now I feel dumb for not watching it. I thought it was going to be like oh, this big treatise on uh, all of the Hammer movies. No, it is. I mean, I'll just tell you what it is. It's uh, it's scenes from this movie put together as if it were a 70s detective show like Columbo. <sighs> I'm so dumb. And I... it uses that theme. And it is so well done. Well, I'm going to watch that. I feel silly. I thought it was something else. No. Ah. 44 seconds. Well, I can spare 44 seconds later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we, we cut to a party with the fresh happening sounds of Stone Ground. <laughs> Stone Ground. I, okay, straight up, I hate this band. Like, they're a nightmare. Mm -hmm. But I would never replace them with anything because apparently the original band was supposed to be the Faces. That was never happening. No, I, it, they might as well have said we were going to have the Beatles do it. <laughs> hey, the Rolling Stones canceled. Hey, Stone Ground. Exactly. <laughs> I I really don't like their music, but I like their attitude and I love this party. This is this could have been the whole movie for me. Is a bunch of square. Like upper class British people with their noses in the air, being shocked mm -hmm. and uh, scandalized by these hippies, which aren't even like being that crazy. They're not even British. They're an American band. Really? Yeah. Oh my god, that explains why they're so authentically shitty. Yeah, they put out. Um, they put out three albums. Yeah, then they reformed and put out like two more. Yeah. <laughs> like, ugh, stop. I like that song. Because it's in this film, it's ridiculous, Alligator Man. <laughs> like, I would never just listen to it, but I like it in the film. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Like, I I would not tr trade Stone Ground for anyone. <laughs> no. The but faces. The faces were never going to be in this No. <laughs> <laughs> but this party is proof that hippies ruin everything, including your carpet. We got our hippie gang here. Um, they are at this party and they're mainly shocking these old folks, but my favorite thing they're doing is debating how long it's going to take for the square that they tricked into inviting them. Like he's calling the cops. And so they're debating on how long it's going to take the police to get there. And I love the, the idea that, you know, his mother's like, who are these people? And he's like, mother, I don't know who they are. <laughs> They snuck in to the party. I only invited the stone ground. And the fact that the band gets name dropped is mind blowing. Like 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 he like he's like, Oh, I'll just I'll call up the Stone Ground and see if they'll come over to my party. How many slasher films have you seen? How many horror films have you seen where the band not only are they playing under their own name? But they're name dropped in the dialogue. <laughs> like, Never is so rare. It's like really rare, and usually they're not even a real band. No, I mean, but oh my god, I, I think a lot of it might have had to do with. Uh, I think were they on? They were on Warner Brothers Records, right? Which is exactly. why they exactly, yeah, why they ended up in the movie. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. 
So, uh, but there, yes, let's talk about our, our suave, debonair, and all around good looking man, Johnny Alucard, played by mm. none other than Christopher, bleh, Christopher Neem. I like Christopher Neem. He, uh, he's oh. actually, he's got a bit part, wow. uh, in another Hammer film, uh, Lust for a Vampire, which is one that I really enjoy, oh, but it gets yeah. a lot of, it gets a lot of derision from the Hammer people on Facebook whom I'm not in their group anymore because they're elitist. <laughs> and I'm not even like that. I don't accuse people of being elitists. <laughs> but they're elitists. Um, anyway, he, one of his claims to fame is that he was in a Doctor Who serial written by Douglas Adams of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that was never really finished oh, I because, of a, because of a strike. And the name of it was Shada. And they eventually, <clears throat> excuse me, relatively recently, took all of it together and they did some animation and they used the original people, their voices and the original audio equipment that they used to record their voices back in the late seventies. Wow. That's awesome. And he was in it. And our main man, Scott actually sent me Shada on Blu-ray for my birthday or Christmas or Arbor Day because we, we exchange Arbor Day. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> No, but he's but, got uh, a, Christopher Neem, yeah. He's got a great look. And a great career too. Jeez. Yeah. No, I I have um I've heard of the the Shada storyline. Mm -hmm. That's uh, good. But I've never seen any of the recreated episodes that did. Mm -hmm. And I know I've seen Lust for a Vampire. Oh, it's so good. Um unlike Italian and Spanish horror, which I can keep separated in my mind when it comes to Hammer vampire movies. I'm a mess. Like, I know I've seen all of the Christopher Lee ones, but once you get into uh, Twins of Evil, Lust for a Vampire, and some of those, like, I get really confused as to whether or not I've seen them. <laughs> yeah, Lust for a Vampire is part of the, uh, the Karnstein trilogy. Yeah. Uh, it's often considered the least of the three, but I don't think it is. Actually, I bought it for Trevor on Blu-ray this past Christmas because I knew that he would enjoy it because of uh, Bobbins. And <laughs> Cause. Uh, something else I want to mention uh, really quickly. There are several people in this film that were actually associated with James Bond. Ooh. Christopher Neen was in a Bond film. Of course, as we all know, uh, Christopher Neen, Christopher Lee was in a Bond film. That's right. Uh, Michael Kitchen, who is in this, whom you probably know as Foil from Foil War. Oh, yeah. He played Bill Tanner in two of the James Bond films. And nice. as a side note, Caroline Monroe was offered the opportunity to play the villainous Ursa in Superman. And instead, she played Naomi in The Spy Who Loved Me. That's awesome. She would have made so that Ursa, too. Yes, yeah, she would have. So that's four four people from this that were in Bond films. Nice. And one almost Superman. Two. And one almost Superman. Two. These hippies, they like they you know, they're they're your usual standard everyday hippie, but he's more of a foppish type of guy. He's got the big fluffy collar and the sweet like uh freaking uh felt looking uh, maybe a like Nehru jacket or something. And he just mm -hmm. looks amazing. They look like, they look like dog shit compared to him. Yeah, uh, but he's like totally got them convinced that the cops will not arrive for eight minutes. And of course, the cops arrive after four and a half minutes. All these hippies are like, "Let's blow, man!" So they all freaking take off. He takes the longest to leave to make sure that he can harass the lady of the house by acting like he's going to break one of her statuettes, mm -hmm. which um. Her husband probably got, while he was in, you know, China, oppressing mm -hmm. the people there. Ugh. But as he walks out, he just casually knocks it over and breaks it anyway. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Let's talk about some of our, our hippies. And by some of them, I mean, let's talk about Stephanie Beecham. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie Beecham plays Jessica Van Helsing. Uh, she is the granddaughter of our, our Christopher Linus. I mean, mm -hmm. Christopher Linus. Our, our, our Peter Cushingness. 
But uh, Stephanie Beecham also a huge like amount of frickin' credits to her name. She was in Hammer Films, Amicus Films, Pete Walker Films, and Norman J. Warren Films. <laughs> oh my god. So she hit almost <laughs> every the uh, yeah, the entire British horror film industry because she's in this for Hammer. She's in and now the screen starts for Amicus. She's in House of Mortal Slick Sin slash the Confessional and Schizo for oh for Pete Walker, and then she's in Inseminoid oh my God. for Norman J. Warren. So <laughs> I've always been a really big fan of hers oh, anyway. I have been meaning to rewatch Inseminoid. Yes. I remember I did not care for it at all. Like years and years and years ago. I was like, oh this isn't good, blah. But then I got that British horror box set. So do I. And it's got that, and it's got um, Tower of Evil, and Horror Hospital, yes, and that Voodoo one that nobody watched. I watched. <laughs> I've still you never did, you seen. Didn't either, I did man. not. <laughs> but I've been looking at that. I'm like, it's like, hmm. And of course, the big debate on that set is: is it anamorphic or is it not? Ooh, and, and that's another one that I don't, I'll never know the answer because I didn't understand it. <laughs> Does it fill your screen? Oh, it fills my screen all right. <laughs> no, if it's like a, if it's like a little box, if it if it just fills up part of your screen and there's dark like like there's black mm-hmm. on the left bars. and right. Yeah, my dad hates those bars. I've told you that before, haven't I? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> oh, my dad's like, I won't watch, I won't watch a widescreen movie because they're wasting the television, and I'm like. No, you actually get to see it as they meant for it to be seen, and you get to see why. And he's like, no, watch it with the black bars. Yep. I'm like, you are a very intelligent man, and I believe you are messing with me right now. And they'll never know. Not for not know. for certain. Not for certain. No. no yeah, yeah, this is this is where the movie itself is in widescreen, but it's not filling your entire screen. Mm. So mm. it's like watching a widescreen movie on a small TV. It's very annoying. Gotcha. So, yeah. But that's not what's keeping me from watching it. I think it's just because it's called Inseminoid. <laughs> I remember liking it. I think it was the last, like, when I had my big Norman J. Warrenthon. Yeah. It, it, I went chronologically. So, I think that's, no, I guess maybe Bloody New Year was the last one. Oh, yeah. But I liked Inseminoid. I mean, it was a, I mean, it's an alien ripoff, yeah. knockoff, you know. I, hey, if I can get through Shocking Dark, I can get through anything. You can do it. <laughs> and I will. But she's just so lovely in this. Mm, she's she really is. Uh, she's a self-professed uh, not druggy, mm-hmm. she, and she's also not sleeping around. When she's trying to mm-hmm. assure her grandfather she's not a bad girl, it's very cute. It is. There's her, uh, Jessica, and then her boyfriend is a dipshit. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is her boyfriend? Bob, right? Yeah, Bob is Philip, played by Philip Miller. Uh, mm. Didn't do a lot. He's a goofball. He wants to get in on all these parties and all these silly actions with all these morons. Mm-hmm. They're kind of like Good Time Charlies, I think. I think you're right. I think those yeah. are Good Time Charlies. But yeah, the next day they go to the their coffee shop they go to called The Cavern, where they, they meet up to discuss you know the party and what's going on. And the next thing, but there's always the next thing. And that's where Johnny comes in and is like, you guys want to have some real kicks? Let's have a black mass. <laughs> yes. I mean, no. And uh, I love how in this movie they refer to summoning the devil as only a giggle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Johnny promises them uh, devilry. Jess isn't sure about all this stuff, but... Her grandfather, Mr. Van Helsing, just happens to be an authority on all things magical. So she she goes back home and immediately goes into his library and finds a freaking book on black masses to read. And as soon as a good old grandpappy comes home and we get Peter Cushing interacting with Stephanie Beecham, you realize that sometimes the generation gap is a gorge. Yeah. It's so cute. This whole interaction of him, like, I mean, I would watch frickin' Peter Cushing make pancakes, especially if they were the perfect well, pancake. That was a great plug. You know, he was supposed to, he was supposed to play her father, but his wife had just died, and he right? looked so terrible, dude, that they made him as 
her grandfather. I mean, it's it's very sad, but I think he looked too old to be her father before that incident. <laughs> uh, probably. You're probably right. Uh, a little piece of trivia. When you see his desk, there's a black and white photo of a lady with dark hair. Yep. And that is Peter Cushing's actual wife that had recently died. Oh, man. Yeah, they were... <clears throat> they had quite a love story, and he, he was crushed when she died, and he almost retired completely, but his pal Christopher Lee was like, dude, you need to get out of the house. I read that he ran up and down the stairs really fast, as fast as he could, in the hopes of bringing on a heart attack. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. No, I am. Oh, yeah, my God. That's a, that's a, like, that was a quote from him, that he ran up and down the stairs really, really hard. God, I would bring on a heart attack so you could go be with her. See, I love Lietta, but I would never exercise. No, I mean, even if it meant getting closer to her in death. I mean, I yeah, I mean, I would exercise for Elizabeth. <laughs> I'd be closer <laughs> exercising for Lietta, probably. Folks, I'm kidding. I died years ago. Yeah, it was Casper, the Britney <laughs> Ghost mattress. You're is, sleeping on me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Folks, check, no. check your mattress. You might be sleeping on me. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Yes. Christopher Lee or Peter Cushing? Mm, damn, I got I got to go Cushing on that one. Absolutely. Did we That's talk about this answer. once upon a time? You know, it sounds I thought familiar. about making this the question time for this episode, but the opportunity just arose and I used it. So oh, I, I'm, but I'm, when I thought about it earlier, I thought. I asked Richard this like in just real life or on the show. Maybe years ago because I, I recall copying things we've already done. That's, dude, the show's been around so long it doesn't matter. <laughs> How many years have we been doing this? Uh this is this is the ten years, I believe. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Still going strong. Yikes. <laughs> uh, and and we have a witch. Ah, uh, she's excited. <laughs> I've been doing it for like four years, so <laughs> I'm guaranteed to be on three episodes a year. We can get it down to less than that. Come on. I mean, if I work at it. But here's the thing what you bring to the show is worth 20 episodes. Well, so you're ahead of the game. You're, game. you're, well, you're already into that. 2022, buddy. What happened to Tom? Because I'm thinking 2021, <laughs> I'm going to be on more shows. And here's the first one for the year, and it's March. But you've already been on one this year. That, just this one. No, the, no, the, the slashers, the 1982 slashers. Yeah, but we didn't do that this year. Yeah, but I released it this year. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. The generation gap is a gorge. <laughs> hey, my birthday's next week, but yet I didn't cancel and say, oh. Like, when I was in high school, my, some of my friends had a foreign exchange student. His name was Shintaro. Shintaro. And, yeah, and he was from Asia. Right. I don't remember where, but I hated him. He was awful. He was just an awful person. <laughs> oh, Centaro. Like, just like a wet blanket. And my friend Ben Jones, I'd be like, let's go do so-and-so. And he's like, oh, we better let Shintaro decide because he's only got 1,740 days left in America. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> but it was always, Shintaro's only got 560 days left in America. We should let him do whatever. And I'm like, Shintaro sucks, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> they were into soccer, which apparently is popular worldwide. I no, don't care. haven't heard of it. I, I'm going to say, Brad, I think we should have asked Shintaro what he thinks. Peter Cushing yeah. or Christopher Yeah, Lee. <laughs> we, Let's let Shintaro pick the movie, because he only has 6,027 <laughs> days left in America. I'm sure he's... I could not wait for him to go back to Asia. I'm sure wherever he is, he's very happy now. Soccer. Soccer. None of those people are would ever listen to this. So a lot of care. Well, that was like when I went to my friend's uh, bachelor party, and, and it was me and all of his soccer friends, and mm. uh, they immediately made it clear that I should not be there. <laughs> wow! So I bailed. Hooligans. I was Hooligans like, they I are. was like, Matt, I gotta go, dude. And he's like, What? I'm like, I gotta go, dude. I, this isn't my scene. He's like, Oh no, no, I'm sorry. And he apologized for inviting me. Because right. he felt so bad that I was hanging out with people I couldn't talk to. And I was like, no, no, I'm sorry for bailing on your bachelor party. And then I went to uh, Sound Exchange and I bought the Mario Bava box, too. That is a that is probably the best story I've heard <laughs> in quite some time. <laughs> Soccer's was... loss was Mario Bava's game. 
I'm telling you, I have no regrets. I'm missing that. <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> They're going to meet the, the good time. Charlie's here. They're going to meet at this old church, which is being torn down, which is of course, where the OG Van Helsing is buried. And uh, yeah, Jessica doesn't find that very funny. Uh, she f- <laughs> So they're going to go do this black mass thing with them, them with Johnny and all the hippie, hippie dippy gang. And she immediately finds, you know, a Van Helsing grave. And she's like, that's not cool. <laughs> but they decide to go for it. And all the gang is there in their black robes. And uh, this ritual sequence is uh, it's a little uh, over the top. <laughs> So he's doing this can- incantation and he's got this crazy music playing with crazy sound effects and he's just like chanting and chanting and chanting. The wind's kicking up and he calls upon Jessica. I call upon you, Jessica. And Jessica, who looks mortified, like terror stricken and slightly hypnotized, is like, no, thank you. And that's when good old Carolyn Monroe steps up. Carolyn Monroe is playing... Uh, Laura, and mm-hmm. she jumps up and she's like, Johnny, take me, <laughs> take me. And everyone's like, I wish she was talking to me. Yeah. One of the most beautiful women in the world. Oh my God, man. Carolyn Monroe, freaking Slaughter High, Golden Voyage of Sinbad, freaking mm-hmm. Maniac. Of course, uh, we talked about her, uh, her cameo. In uh, Don't Open Till Christmas, mm-hmm. where she plays herself. Yes. <laughs> so Simon favorite. Oh, it's a great, it's great. Way, way back, uh, Jeffrey and I talked about Faceless. Yeah, you did. So she's she's been in, she's in the world of Jess Franco and the world of Hammer Horror. That's brilliant. Yeah, that music he plays, are you saving that for trivia? No, or? no, what's that? So for the Black Mass segment, this is straight from Wikipedia. The film used the track Black Mass, an Electric Storm in Hell by the pioneering electronic group White Noise, which included Delia Derbyshire, who Ooh. wrote the Doctor Who theme. Nice. It all comes back um, to the Doctor. It does. And then Christopher Neem's dialogue, Christopher Neem that was in Doctor Who, was later sampled by Orbital, one of my favorite electronic oh, groups. Orbital's great. Yes, for Satan Live and Tension. Mm, nice. He puts a uh, good old uh, Laura on the, the altar and he, he has her hold his chalice, if you know what I mean. Mm, I know what you mean. And then he slices his wrist and starts pouring blood into it. And <laughs> along with, uh, of course, uh, Dracula's ashes. And uh, as he's doing this, this uh, his cup runneth over <laughs> and he <laughs> splatters blood all over her. And that's it. The whole place goes completely bonkers. The hippies are, they're about to puke. They're freaking out. They run out. Laura tries to leave. And this is the scariest part of the movie for me. She, she gets off the altar and then stops and then falls to her knees screaming that she can't move. Her friends are leaving her behind and she's just screaming. I can't move. I'm like, that part freaks me out, dude. Yeah. So sad. And then Dracula's back. Dracula, you know, the uh, the ground is pulsating and everything, and he, like, stands up from his burial plot. He comes face-to-face with Johnny, and Johnny's like, Master, I summoned you! And without missing a beat, Dracula's like, It was my will. Yeah. <laughs> you little bitch, you got nothing to do with me. No, I, I made you do it. I wrote in my notes... Drax back and he's not forking around. No. Shut the fork up. Oh my god. And then uh, the next day they uh they meet up at the cavern to discuss the craziness of the night before and they notice that Laura's not there. Mm-hmm. And then uh <laughs> someone's I believe Johnny says that Laura might be a little drained. Yeah. And so she was too tired, but I'm like, haha, drained. That's funny. Because, of course, Dra- inside. Dracula drank her. Johnny does show up to the to the cavern and then gaslights the entire gang <laughs> into thinking that, that uh, they'll find Laura later. Nothing happened. Yep. But remembering. someone does find Laura, a bunch of little tiny creatures. I think in England they're called children. 
mm, are, children are playing in this broken down old church in the lot, and they find uh, Laura's corpse. At the same time, Johnny is tempting. Um, what is her name? I could never catch this girl's name. The black girl. Yeah, I'm not sure myself. The actress's name is Marsha A. Hunt, and she plays Gainer. The terrible name. I don't remember her ever being called anything. <clears throat> oh, they kept, no, they kept calling her Angel or something, or maybe it's what Johnny called her. You know, she had close relationships with Mark Bolan and really? Mick Jagger, who is the father of her only child, Karis. And according to her, the Rolling Stones' controversial hit song, Brown Sugar, was based on her. What? So I I, not know I just know I her. her. I have to look for her, but she's in uh, The Sender. Oh, really? Yeah. Dude. I haven't seen The Sender in a long time. Well, that could be potential Doom Show material right there, because I have that Blu-ray. I've not fired it up yet. Well, I do remember that one of the first discs I sent you mm -hmm. was The Sender, and I remember, isn't that Quentin Tarantino's favorite film from, or favorite horror film from 1982? Maybe? I just remember begging you to send it to me, and you're like, uh, yeah, dude, I'll send it. And I got it, and it was so good. You know, I've not seen You've seen it since I have, because I had seen it before I sent it to you. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's it, been, that's been, like, a long time. I have an Let's old Fangoria see. where they talk about it, too. Really? Yeah. On the commentary track for the DVD release of Hot Fuzz, Quentin Tarantino described The Cinder as his favorite horror film from 1982. Wow. That's loaded. It's a yeah, loaded somebody, take. Yeah, somebody said that... Uh, they were looking for something else to tap into the slasher film market. Mm -hmm. The director didn't approach it as a slasher horror, remarking that he wanted to make a film that was more Bergman than Carpenter. Ooh. So. Interesting. Yeah, maybe maybe we should check that out for, a, for an episode. I'm, I'm into it. All I know Absolutely. is that around here, QT doesn't stand for uh, Quentin Tarantino. It stands for Queer Tarantula. Queer Tarantula? Yeah. I did not know that. Mm. Neither did I. Gay spiders. Huh? Hey, they got a right. They got rights too, buddy. I'm not holding them back. <laughs> so uh, Johnny's talking up. Who I'm going to call Angel because obviously that's more memorable than Gainer. Gainer. And he talks to her about this jazz concert. He's got tickets for a jazz concert, and Jessica's not tempted because, of course, the initial invitation was to Jessica, but she's turning him down. And bless her heart, Angel is like, I would sell my soul to go to this jazz concert. I'm like, me too. Mm. Me too, my friend. But it's time for the police to get involved because they're the most memorable part of this movie. No, this has cops in it, but and they're going to work with Peter Cushing to, to solve this, but they're not so memorable. <laughs> well, the, I mean, the main inspector I really like. Who is he? Michael Coles. He's, uh, he comes back in the, uh, in the next film, The Stand Christ Dracula. Really? Along with Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, he is the only person to appear twice in a hammer record. That's amazing. And, yeah, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. Honestly, he's a big part of me liking these. I, I've always really liked them. Wow. Well, I, I was less than impressed, but now I'm going to reevaluate for our, our double header year. Yeah, he died pretty young, really, in 2005, which I've always thought was, was sad because... I really like him. He's also in uh, Doctor Who and the Daleks. Yeah, I know. It's funny. Like, you think about someone like that, if he'd lived, you know, like another decade or so, he'd be in like a thousand different British mystery shows since, yeah. you know, they, they never stopped making British mystery shows, obviously, but mm -hmm. there's been a renaissance since like the early 2000s through mm -hmm. like now where they're still going. So you take mm -hmm. any freaking one of these British mystery shows, like... Midsummer Murders, or any of the different adaptations of Agatha Christie, and all you see is all old horror people. Yeah, I mean, everybody. Whenever in we're it. watching, whenever we're watching something British, and Elizabeth says, "We know that lady," or "We know that dude," yeah. or "I say it." Yep. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, they're in a Midsummer Murder. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Johnny makes his move, and uh, he he tries to bring uh, Angel to uh, Dracula. Which uh, plays really funny for a second. <clears throat> We're like, oh, Dracula, you old racist. <laughs> but no, it's this, he just wants Jessica. He's been wanting Jessica this whole time, but Johnny can't mm -hmm. bring her butt. 
he does drain the life out of our, our pal. And uh, he's it's so funny because after he consumes the blood of this girl, she turns pale, like completely like white. And Leanna's mm-hmm. like, I don't think that's what black people look like when they're dead. <laughs> It's so cheesy. Well, it's so cheesy. But you know what? They have to make it look dramatic. Mm-hmm. So it's Maybe. it's just funny. Oh, uh, Johnny, which uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but Alucard is Dracula backwards. What? Which is great watching uh, Peter Cushing try to work that out. Oh, boy. <laughs> Leanna's like, that is not an anagram. That is just ridiculous. Uh Uh-huh. It's just backwards. (laughs) Oh, my God. It's so cute. Johnny begs good old Dracula to to give him the powers because he could find, he could get Jessica if he would just give him the vampiric powers. And they don't show uh, Christopher Lee drinking. No, no, no. They don't show him drinking Johnny because that'd look gay. Mm. But wouldn't that have been great? Like... If, like, a man drinks the blood of another man in one of these vampire movies, that'll give it, like, a gay subtext. And in my brain, I'm like, please, <laughs> just give us the subtext. It'll be great. I think they intended that anyway, because I read somewhere something about the, the homoerotic subtext of uh, the film, which, I mean, wasn't even there, really. Nope. As far as, as, far as that goes, I've often heard that... Uh, David Peel's character in The Brides of Dracula is meant to be the first gay vampire. Oh, nice. I like that. Yeah. He is rather fabulous. Gay Dracula? Oh, I know that guy. Yeah, you do. Around here, we just call him... Oh my god, I forgot his name. <laughs> it's uh, Liza Minnelli, one of her husbands. David... No, no, no. David... You mean Edmund Purdom? Edmund Purdom, that's who I'm thinking yeah. of. <laughs> I forgot about the the uh, Liza Minnelli's husband. Oh, yeah. I he's, forgot about he, him. Yeah, that's where I originally came up with uh, <laughs> with gay Dracula. <laughs> David Guest, G-E-S-T. David Guest, there you go. Yeah. But yeah no, Edmund Purdom is our favorite, endearing, lovely gay Dracula. Jess's boyfriend, whoever he is, it turns out that he's in on it. He got gotten, so now he's going to help them get good old jessica and uh vampy johnny and and almost forgets and they almost go to drink her blood but he's like nope she's for the master van helsing tracks down johnny because you know he's found out that of course jessica's missing and uh one of the things that kills vampires in this apparently is running water yes so van helsing he uses that trusty anti-vampire Freaking technique of throwing them in the shower. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's um works a little anticlimactic. It's wet. Yeah, it's so yeah, wet. It's wet. Man. But uh, he finds out where the uh, this all is going to go down because it's at the church, which we knew it was going to be the church. But the reason, I guess, the reason that wasn't working before was because the police were guarding the church. So Van Helsing asks the inspector to take off the police watch off of this church. So he'll go there. He's like, just give me an hour. Just give me one hour and I'll solve this shit. So then we have the one of the least impressive of the Cushing versus Lee showdowns. They kind of do hint at it in that VHS cover where he's like slowly edging towards him with some holy water. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he does prepare. He does a cool uh, montage thing where he prepares some stakes in a pit. On yeah. the church grounds to get him. And they have their showdown. He saves Jessica. There was <laughs> some discussion between you and I about uh, Stephanie Beecham's uh, Beecham's. Uh-huh. uh-huh. And how <laughs> even Peter Cushing was having trouble with his scenes because he's trying to, like, put this cross around her neck while she's under Dracula's spell and her breasts are fighting him. <laughs> yeah. Well... They're never going to call it grits. Can you imagine that on the big screen back in the day, dude? <laughs> oh like, when, when she has the nightmare and he wakes her up, he's very careful with his hands. Dude, Hammer Horror, they were the king of the boobies. Yeah, they really were. Like, I, I just keep thinking about blood from the mummy's tomb, dude. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, it's so funny. They they knew their audience. Yeah, they did. Oh, boy. So, God bless them. 
he manages to rescue Jessica and he manages to destroy Dracula. For some reason, Dracula doesn't turn to dust this time so much as he turns to Glopola. Mm-hmm. He turns into a freaking pile of uh, freaking old pancakes. I love it. Peter Cushing actually says to him, You're done, motherfucker. <laughs> and the day is saved. Dracula is defeated until the next film. Woo. Until he comes back. Man. Outstanding. Yeah, it happened. <laughs> so, Brad, well. you got some other sweet <laughs> trivia on this thing? I do. I got some stuff to say about this old film. I want to hear it. This one and the film we're about to talk about are the two that I saw the most out of the series when I was a kid. Wow. Uh, and I can get, I'll get into why Satanic Rites was one of them that I saw the most as a kid. I saw this at my grandparents' house. I love how it goes from 1872 up into the air and you see a plane. It's not a match cut like uh, two, uh, like 2001, but it makes me think of it uh, because nice. it's a similar idea where the bone turns into the satellite or the spaceship or whatever. Uh, this is one of Tim Burton's favorites, apparently. Oh, I've nice. seen him mention that a couple <laughs> places. That's funny. The uh, British author critic Kim Newman put it in his top ten vampire films. Uh, nice. This is the seventh in the series, if you count Rides of Dracula, and why wouldn't you? Because Peter Cushion plays Van Helsing in it. So, this film was criticized. One thing they criticized about it was the fact that Dracula never leaves the church. Now, as a child, I never that never crossed my mind. No, why would At I? all. No. That he didn't. And I know that probably they were wanting to see Count Dracula swing in London, him prowling. I believe it was Tim Lucas, I think, that mentioned how in Black Sunday, the witch never leaves the crypt. Ah. But nobody but nobody really said anything or minded, whereas in this, <laughs> it seems like people didn't mind it. It's got some weaknesses. The Satanic Rites of Dracula, I will brook no criticism of because it is, I champion it. Nice. I love this one as well. But yeah, I mean, it's got some weaknesses. You don't see Dracula except for castle i mean it's the church excuse me uh his fight with cushing not that hot but it just has so much else going for it uh that i really 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 love nice uh it was a break from the previous film uh scars of dracula which is is i in my opinion is easily the worst of the series wow uh, it's 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 kind of cheaply made i like it i don't love it i think it's the the least of them but of course, with this one leading right into the Satanic Rites of Dracula, I have always really enjoyed it. And I'll have a lot to say when we get to Satanic Rites of Dracula. But friend of the show, a friend of us in real life, David Ladd. So let me tell you how I met David Ladd. He liked or commented or something, a show post, way back. So I clicked on him with his page, and his banner photo was a picture of Dracula 80, 1972. <laughs> cool. So, I sent him a message, or a friend request, and I told him, anybody that has a banner photo of Dracula 80, 1972 is already a friend of mine. <laughs> and, of course, we've been good friends ever since. Um, he and his wife are doing a podcast. Uh, they've had an introduction episode, and then they've had their official episode one come out. I haven't heard the episode one yet. It's on the film Rad. Oh, nice. <laughs> but the the introduction episode was excellent. Uh, him and Sherry, his wife, she comes from a not, she's not like us, you know, insane about film. And of course, David is a huge cinema fan. So yeah, I'm really going to look forward to, and, and it already happened in the intro episode, the interplay between someone whose life is not just breathing cinema like a lot of us uh, and then someone that is, you know, more along our lines as far as, as a film lover. Uh, so I think she's going to bring a very, a very intriguing viewpoint. I really enjoyed the first, the, the introduction episode where they named, uh, their favorite films. So if you guys have a chance, you know, it's called the movie clinic. I would highly recommend checking it out. Really good intro episode. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more. Yeah. David and Sherry, they're good friends of the show. Mm hmm. Uh, I'm sitting here in my library where I record the podcasts, and I'm looking at an autographed print of Batman by my favorite comic book artist, 
Neil Adams says for Brad Neil Adams that Mr. David Ladd himself got signed wow. for me at a comic show and I've got it framed hanging up and I just absolutely love it. It it hangs underneath my Batman clock, which I removed from the library before we record, else Richard be yelling at me. <laughs> yeah, we're we're down a cuckoo clock. <laughs> yeah. We had one we had one in here and then I would shut it off every time because the ticking sound was driving my editing brain completely crazy. Yeah. And then I it, took then it just two died. Out of here. Oh wow. It died, it really did. Yeah, well yeah, I was trying to figure out how to repair it. Oh man, like, that whoops. sucks. So I we still got the other clock. two clocks that chime, but yeah. Right. I like to hear that. See, I don't mind the ticking like in real life, but when I'm it listening was, to it, oh boy. Yeah. They, I had two <laughs> clocks in here. See, I've actually got a, I've got four clocks in here. Oh my but, God. <laughs> but one of them doesn't tick. The other one is a big digital one that Tim got me from China. Mm. But the two that tick, I, I just take out of here before I, we record. I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put you through it. But no, I love Dracula AD 1972. I have since I was a child. That's awesome. Uh, I, I believe is was this not this time, but you've only seen it what once or twice. Yeah, this is my third viewing. Third viewing. Yeah, because I had been I had been avoiding this and Satanic R- Rites of Dracula uh, because I didn't know they were two different films, and hmm. the Satanic Rites of Dracula was always on the budget compilations. And it's I public ju- domain. Exactly. I just wanted mm-hmm. to see a good copy of it, so I kept putting it off, mm-hmm. not realizing I was putting off two films. Mm. And then for um, the Unseenly Movie-thon I did, I had actually picked up this Blu-ray, the, oh. the, the Warner's one. Yes. And so I was like, well, I'll get to that. And then for Movie Party Crew, Scott suggested we do this and Satanic Rites of Dracula back to back. So I went ahead God and I bought him. the other Blu-ray. I bought the the Satanic Rites of Dracula, the other Warner Brothers yes. one, and proceeded to watch Dracula eighty nineteen seventy two again, which I just love. And then having my mind blown by the next film we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. Yes. So yeah, because I I think uh, I like that one better than this one. But I love this. This is. I have waited way too long to watch this, or you could say I waited until the perfect time to see this when my my tastes had aligned just what I needed. Um, this is equal amounts of color, energy, and the ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It all comes together. Everyone is so good in this. You know, there's a, there's a few not so memorable characters, uh, but it just. Man, this thing is so lively. Mm -hmm. And I think, from what I remember of Scars of Dracula, I think you're spot on. I think it was pretty, uh, you know? Yeah, I mean, Elizabeth, uh, I asked for it for Christmas. She bought me the the Blu-ray of Scars of Dracula because I am a completist. You gotta have it. Yeah, but no, it's... I mean, it's not absolutely terrible. No. The uh, the elitists that I were talking about, uh, if you if you were to get on their group and say, you know, I really like the Scars Dracula, they would try to make you feel like shit about it, <laughs> and, uh, and probably lust for a vampire and a few other ones too. Yeah, uh, while they're at it. So <laughs> yeah, and so when I'm I'm just not that way uh, at all. Well, you know what I saw very recently. Uh, for movie party crew, I'd never seen uh, Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was a good time. That's great stuff right there, man. Yeah, that was uh, Hammer reaching out to Run Run Shaw, the Shaw Brothers. Uh, uh, yeah, my guy was in that. I can never remember. This. I guess I shouldn't call him my guy, since I can't remember his damn name. Um, that's what I typed in. I typed in Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, and it's like, oh, what are you looking for? I'm like, why don't you eat a dick? Uh, oh, it's a uh, David Chang. Ah, uh, David Chang. I mean, that. I mean, that movie's before you know the, the hopping vampire genre, where they really mix the two. Yep, it's it's so good. Um, because I think the movie I'm thinking of is called Vengeance. That's not the original title. Um, yeah, it was David Chang, and it's called Vengeance. Uh, the original title is Bao Chu. And I believe I'm butchering that as well, but it is one of my favorite, 
favorite, favorite kung fu films. It is so awesome. You have to see Vengeance from 1970 in good old Halloween Resurrection. Buster Rhymes is watching a film and he's doing all the moves and acting all kung fu as uh, good old uh, Buster Rhymes is wont to do. He's watching Vengeance. Really? Yep. That is some great A trivia right there. <laughs> hey, sir. come on. Uh, well, you know me, Halloween Resurrection, it's risen to the top of my favorite freaking uh, Halloween movies now. Absolutely, it has. Hey, it's a Dangertainment production. <laughs> <laughs> Priceless. Is there anything else you want to talk about this movie before we move on to Satanic Rites of Satan? No, sir. I think uh, I think I think I'm good on it. All right, folks. Here is a trailer for the Satanic Rites. Religious rites become obscene orgies. In Count Dracula and his vampire bride, the King of the Undead marries the queen of the zombies. Who are the living and who are the dead? As the two masters of menace struggle, Count Dracula and his vampire bride, rated R. Satanic Tires of Dracula, part one. Three, two, one. Okay, that was the frickin' TV spot for the satanic rites of Dracula, a.k.a. Dracula and his Vampire Brides. Mm. From 1973, but released in the States five years later in 1978, which is amazing. But before we get to that, while we were not recording between our recordings, we learned some sad news. Brad, did you want to talk about the sadness? Yeah, uh, Norman J. Warren famed British horror director has died. And of course he was uh, the director in one of our early episodes on terror and also did such films as Satan slave uh, in Seminoid bloody new year. Just a really, a really talented guy uh, for uh, low budget horror. I didn't realize he'd retired so early. Well, he had another film that he wanted to make and just, it never, it never came together. 1987 to 2021 is a long time for it to not come together. Oh my God. Very talented guy. Uh, I love terror, Satan slave, bloody new year and Seminoid oh, yeah. is a hoot. Yeah. I've been hankering to rewatch in Seminoid and I, I'm a huge fan of, uh, Satan slave. And of course, of course, terror, man, I think we talked about that recent ish where I was reliving how or uh, retelling how I freaking hated it the first time because I used to have rules as to like what horror movies had to be like and a certain quality that all movies had to uh, like standards all movies had to meet mm -hmm. and then many years later I watched terror because someone was like you're an idiot rewatch it why do you hate it and I was like, okay, I'll give it another shot. And I totally did a, a 180 on it or, or just a 97 degree love festival. I love right. terror, man. It's so awesome. Uh, it is. It's my favorite by him. I remember <clears throat> asking you if it was any count and you said it is very count. Nice. And I was like, well, I want to see it. And I bought the, um, uh, the DVD with uh, The Devil's Men or yes. what Land of the Minotaur, yep. which I've still not watched. Oh, you have to Peter see that. Cushion. You uh, have to see that. <laughs> and yeah, I think I got it from Netflix originally and watched it that way. And then, of course, the Blu-ray from Vinegar Syndrome came out. I know Kat Ellinger knew him, had interviewed him, and she's always talked about what a lovely guy he was. It's just it's sad news. Between Dracula AD 1972 and the Satanic Rites of Dracula, I've become a year older. Wow. This show will age you. <laughs> it will. <laughs> I found a VHS tape here. This is the always classy Front Row Entertainment 
uh, mm. VHS of the Satanic Rites of Dracula. And uh, here is the plot synopsis on the back. Some of London's leading citizens are involved in a satanic cult whose rituals center around the worship of blood. And who is the leader of said cult? None other than Count Dracula, Christopher Lee himself. The cult is working on the development of a mutant strain of the bubonic plague virus with the intent of ending all life on Earth. Which is funny because they're successful in 2021. That is, unless mm -hmm. the occult expert hired by Scotland Yard, Peter Cushing, can stop them in time. Where is Peter Cushing these days? He is a CGI man in Rogue One. Apparently. I love, like, all those poor, out-of-work Peter Cushing lookalikes who didn't get the job, who didn't get the gig. It's so sad. Because <laughs> they were like... No, we got this. We have a whole department of people waiting to recreate a dead man. <laughs> That's funny you say that because Peter Cushing famously did not wear his boots when he was filming Star Wars because they were ill-fitting. And so George Lucas said that that's why they could never they could never use that footage or, you know, use it to recreate because he's not wearing boots. And I thought <laughs> You can do all these things with CGI, and you can't put some digital boots on <laughs> Peter Cushing. I just, I think it's a, it's a cop out or something. Oh my god, digital boots! And all they had to do is just get a guy who looked like him, and then do his makeup to make him look like him, and then uh -huh. have someone do an impression. And you can have two actors. You have the guy who looks like him, and then a voice actor who sounds like him. You're still spending less than you are on a CGI, but I'm like. Or is this long term where they're worried about the royalties to said actor? I don't even understand how freaking Hollywood works. Uh -uh, <laughs> this is neither. neither this is neither there nor there. So uh <laughs> freaking Alan Gibson, uh who directed Dracula AD nineteen seventy two, he hath returned to do the the sequel. This was written by Don Houghton. He returned from uh, Dracula AD nineteen seventy two and he also would go on to do The Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, mm. which is everyone's favorite Hammer film. Ask anyone uh -huh. who likes Hammer. Uh, your bud, exactly. Inspector Murray's back. Yeah, as I mentioned, the only person to appear twice in a Hammer Dracula film other than Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. Even uh, our pal uh, Stephanie Beecham is gone. Yep, but uh, if you're going to have to replace her... <laughs> Joanna Lumley is a great choice. Holy shit, dude. So Joanna Lumley of uh, absolutely fabulous fame. And the New Avengers. The what? The New Avengers. Oh, the New Avengers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when they when they rebooted uh, the Avengers UK in the 70s, they Steed was still there. So Patrick Manny was still there. Uh, but they added a, a younger guy and, of course, a, a woman. And the woman was Joanna Lumley. It's a great show. I love it. Nice. See, I thought she was uh, working with Tony Stark. No. Ha-ha. <laughs> that's uh, that's Jenny a gutter. Yeah. Uh, but uh, she was also in a Simon favorite, um, Sapphire and Steel, which is uh, excellent. I've only seen two of the stories, maybe three of the stories. But man, that show is excellent. Yes, it is. Let's see. So in 1971, she was in The House That Dripped Blood. She was, unfortunately, her scenes were deleted from the abominable Dr. Fibes. I believe she's in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, isn't she? Yes, she was. She played the English girl. The English girl. And she was, well, that was also, that was, no, it's perfect. She was also in uh, freaking a couple episodes of Are You Being Served? Yes, I remember her being in Are You Being Served. I have a newfound appreciation for her because I was never an absolutely fabulous fan. Yeah. Who knows? I might be now. Oh, I, I'd recommend giving another shot. When I was in high school, <clears throat> and I think I've mentioned this to you before. I don't know if I've mentioned on the show, but uh, our cable system, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it changed every 12 hours. So you had VH1, and then at like midnight, it would change to Comedy Central. And then at noon, it would change back to VH1. Whoa. That's weird. Which was weird. It is weird. But we would, uh, at the time, back in the 90s, they played Absolutely Fabulous all the time. Yep. And I think it's probably, 
it's probably a more adult show than anything that I would have been interested in at the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, it's it's one of those things I loved, and then I I needed a break from it, and then the break went on for a really long time. But I always enjoy it. If if Leanna just happens to have it on, I will just sit there and watch the whole thing. Right. Can't resist. Cannot. Uh, she's the best part of French and Saunders. She's not either one of those. <laughs> I don't know. I was just I was making a dumb joke. <laughs> So, I've seen some French and Saunders. Oh my god, I love that show. They, they're so, their Christmas specials are have some of the most outrageous freaking bits. They did a whole Midsummer Murders parody. Uh, no, no, it wasn't a Midsummer. They did a, a Rosemary and Time parody, which was brilliant. They they almost wow. ruined that show. They were so spot on. It was amazing. And of course, if you can find it, look up the Tipping the Velvet parody. They did a, mo- a parody of that movie. And, uh, really? it, oh my God, <laughs> they, uh, they probably ruined that movie for some people. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. Anyway, back on task, back on what are we talking about? Mm-hmm. Um, so this time around, uh, we got a credit sequence that cracks me up. We got the disco Dracula music and, uh, we've got some, uh, the music is just gorgeous. Lieta said it sounded like some James Bond theme. Yeah, kind of oh, it's just funky. And it's dynamic as hell. It's not just one note. It's like this whole thing, this whole, like, just grand stuff. Who did the music? Wait, did Lieta watch this with you? Oh, yeah. She watched both of these with me. Really? really? Well, I would love to hear her thoughts. I'm guessing she didn't dislike them. Well, there you go. Uh, so the music, this beautiful music we're praise, uh, praising, was uh, John Kakavas. Uh huh. This is the composer for Horror Express. Uh-huh. Ooh, Mortuary! Hey, Bam. We love Mortuary, and of course, we talked about him as also doing their playing with fire, which I still haven't mm-hmm. seen. Oh yeah, I've seen it. You said it was good. Yeah, it's an eighties teen film and then uh, like 20 minutes left in the film a slasher breaks out (laughs) i love it funny thing about this credit sequence with this music is they're showing all these you know picturesque shots of london and uh it's it's called pure gold to spanish and italian uh, giallo makers because they would love this footage because every spanish and italian uh, giallo film is set in england uh, but the the thing it's that true. I love the shadow. They have the shadow of Christopher Lee imposed over yes. the credit sequence. Yes. <laughs> I guess so. You don't notice how little he's in the movie. Maybe. Maybe. But the shadow looks really dumb. It's just so, and it gets bigger and bigger as the the <laughs> the credits go on. <laughs> I love it. I don't think it's dumb at all. It's hilarious. I just. Uh, <laughs> I just don't understand what they're doing. No, I don't either, but I like it. Yep. We cut right to satanic cult time. You see this uh, satanic cult? It's being led by someone named uh, Chin Yang, and she's played by an actress named Barbara Yu Ling. Wow, dude. She was in Hardware? She was the really? she, was, she was the neighbor, the mother in the, the scenes... Where they break into the apartment downstairs. Oh my god, that's great. Uh, but she's leading this uh, this satanic sacrificing. There's a, a blonde lady under a sheet. And uh, she's going to... Uh, see, the weird thing about this movie is this sequence is very short. But then as the movie goes along, it grows. You see more and more footage of this the satanic cult sequence. And I guess we'll come back to it several times. Yeah, they cut in. But there's, there's a whole bunch of people gathered around watching all this stuff go on. Meanwhile, these um, practitioners of the Satan are being monitored by dudes in fur-lined vests. Yeah, Frankenstein <laughs> monster vests. <laughs> I love these vests. They're so great. Oh, boy. Uh, they are, they've got a guy uh, tied to a bed uh, with a mustache, and he is... Uh, he seems like he's comatose, but he comes out of it long enough to to escape his bonds and strangle his captor. 
after he kills his captor, he runs and he sets off. There's motion detectors all over this weird place. So it's, it's a old uh, mansion or old like uh, villa or whatever you call it. Big old house. But it's all suited up to be this like uh, laboratory slash I don't know what. So this guy, he's trying to get away and the whole movie switches from horror to action where we've got the aforementioned motion detectors. We've got guys with silencers. We've got stunts on motorcycles. And I have to know what is going on. Uh... Folks at home, (laughs) folks at home. Brad already knows what I'm about to say. I'm trying not to murder mansion this. And you're doing a fine job. This movie is so complicated if you're trying to follow it moment by moment, which I didn't in my notes. (laughs) I'd say, spoiler alert, but this is in the public domain, so everyone already owns a copy. Uh Uh-huh. And they hand them out. So after this guy gets rescued by some mysterious, we get the mysterious men, we get the MI5 type of guys here. And they're investigating all the big wig muckety mucks that were at this ritual. So apparently it was all the upper echelon of freaking British society was at this thing. We get a slideshow of all the people involved, but dude, one of the pictures is blank. Shocker, because they tried to take a picture of the guy, but he didn't show up on film. What's that mean? So smart. He's he's just sneaky. Uh, we get a uh, a secretary named Jane. Uh, she's working with these MI5 types of guys. Uh, this is Valerie Van Ost. She died recently. Oh, I see that a couple of years ago. She was in, uh, cr- speaking of Peter Cushing, she was in Corruption. It's not just a woman's picture. <laughs> Dude, you got it. That's what it says. <laughs> I know. You got it, folks. <laughs> you got to see Corruption. It's something else. Peter Cushing tried to do, I guess he was trying to break out of his, like, not playing the biggest piece of shit ever in a movie? I own the Blu-ray because I bought it. I'd never seen it. Oh, you've still never seen it? No, I have seen it, but I bought it sight unseen. Gotcha. It is It is a very special movie. Yeah, it's uh, Grindhouse releasing. It's uh, It was Peter Cushing's 100th birthday special edition. Out of all that he did, that's what they said. Well, <laughs> let's celebrate his centenary with this. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, so Jane is, uh, she's there to uh, record the dying words of this cop. So the dude with the mustache who was, uh, who was at this uh, frickin' ritual, he was there undercover. So after he tells them what happened, he croaks, and then she goes home for the night. But she's followed by the, uh, the motorcycle dudes with the frickin' <laughs> Frankenstein vests. <laughs> and they menace her, and she gets uh, abducted. And uh, our pal Inspector Murray, who we talked about earlier, uh, Michael Coles, he comes in and he's working with these dudes. Who are these dudes he's working with? I have no clue. Uh, Richard Vernon is one of them. He plays Matthews. Freddie Jones is not one of them. He's a different guy. Uh, but these, these guys are working together to solve this shit and figure out what is going on. Uh, Murray recommends they call in Professor Lorimer Van Helsing, a.k.a. Peter Cushing. So our boy is back. So we get to see more of the ritual and um, based on this guy's testimony. And uh, we see that the the girl lived. So they stabbed this girl. She's bleeding all over the place. The ritual people are rubbing satanic crosses on their foreheads in her blood. And then all of a sudden her wound heals up and she sits up like, hi, I'm good. Um, it's in this scene where uh, Van Helsing says that evil is more addictive than heroin. <laughs> he does. <laughs> and then we get our cast change where uh, his daughter, uh, excuse me, granddaughter, uh, Jessica Van Helsing walks in. And uh, yeah, she's now Joanna Lumley, as we said. Just bring in the class, dude. I'm telling you. Damn. Um, I wrote in my notes, enter Jessica, exclamation point, Lumley. Exclamation point, and then Julian! Exclamation point. I don't know who Julian is. <laughs> Julian. So, on the satanic worship uh, scenes that they keep intercutting, according to Joe Dante in the trailers from Hell on Ooh, YouTube yes, for yes. the Satanic Rites of Dracula, he said 
that 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 devil worship scene is a favorite among devil worshipers that he knows. <laughs> That's so cool. I and wonder. so I don't know. I don't know if they find it amusing or if they find it close to what they do or wildly inaccurate. I, mean, I would say it probably is, but they <laughs> he says that they really they really like it. That's so cute. Oh, Julian is uh, freaking Freddie Jones' character. So he's this like uh, colleague. That's what of, I thought. Julian of, Keeley. Uh, good old Freddie Jones, legendary freaking. Is he a comedic actor or is he just an all around everything actor? He did a little bit of all of it. You know who his son is? Uh, Spike Jones. Toby Jones. Uh, I should know who that is. I'm going to feel stupid. I'm going to feel real dumb. Barbarian Sound Studio. Oh my god, I'm so stupid. I had no idea they were related. That's brilliant. Yep. Father and son. He just died last year, or the year before now, because we're living in 2021. Yeah, 214 credits. Um, If you've seen anything British, you've seen Freddie Jones. Uh, He's in Mother Flippin' Crawl. Dude. He's the Mother mother Flipper. I like Crawl. I like Crawl. I, I enjoyed it a lot more as an adult than I did as a kid. I used to find... I thought it was cool as a kid, but boring. And as an adult, I'm like, this is great. See, I saw it once maybe as a kid. I had a Kroll coloring book, oddly enough. nice. And I thought the throwing star was really cool. So then I bought the Blu-ray, and I was afraid that it would just suck. But it was even better than I remembered it. I I think it's great. And of course, you know, you got to find that Marvel adaptation. Oh, yeah. Wanna, yeah, you I know, I think that. I had some of that. I think nice. I had some of that. Nice. Actually, I'm curious to see who worked on that because I'm a nerd. David uh, Michelin, Michelini was the writer. Oh, Brett Blevins is a penciler. Ooh. And Vince Coletta inking. Very nice. Editor-in-chief Jim Shooter, bro. Brett Blevins drew. There's uh, the Welcome to the X-Men issue for Rogue. Oh. And... Uh, the cover is Welcome to the X-Men Rogue, if you hope you survive it or something. And it was, uh, he drew it. It was one of the issues I had when I was a kid before I really got into the X-Men. So it was like, you know how you had comic books of stuff and it was just one issue. So you had absolutely no context whatsoever. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. But I remember that. Yeah. One of the, I remember that one. One of the first issues I ever picked up of Uncanny X-Men was issue 235. And uh, mm. in the middle of things, in media rays, as it were, very confusing, but very intriguing. That's all. That's how they hook you. That is how they hook you. Uh, let's see. Freddie Jones was in uh, Goodbye Gemini. Uh, he was in Children of oh, the Stones. Oh man, I love. That's gonna. We're gonna cover that at some point. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Children of the Stones. Uh, in the Devil's Garden. Frankenstein must be destroyed. Um, mm. and of course, Dune. Uh, John Carpenter's John Carpenter. Oh, I wish John Carpenter done Dune. <laughs> I just <laughs> that would have been great. I just mixed up John Carpenter and freaking uh, David Lynch. That's different. A lot of people do that, right? <laughs> they do. X Men two nineteen. Wow. And you know, I think I got that all wrong. But on the cover, it's got Havoc and the X Men. So I think I've, what I've done is I've I've confused Welcome to the X Men, Kitty Pride. Hope yes. you survive. That's okay. I'm so stupid. You want me to fix that? No, I don't care. Let people know. They don't know how stupid I am by now. (laughs) Then then they're even dumber than I am. It comes up in the Google as, Welcome to the X-Men. Hope you survive. It comes up Havoc. So the cover does say, Welcome to the X-Men. Here we go. Here we go. No, dude, you got it. It's Welcome to the X-Men, Kitty Pride. Hope you survive the experience. So one issue 139. You got it. Yeah, but I was... Talking about issue 219. I don't give a shit. I just fixed it. (laughs) (laughs) Nailed it. Nailed it. (laughs) So what the hell was I talking about? Julian was a colleague of Professor Van Helsing. So he's like, I'll just go talk to him and see what he's up to since he's at this satanic ass ritual. And (laughs) when, uh, Peter Cushing goes to see him. Uh, our pal is a little keyed up, wild-eyed and sweating. Uh, he's doing some science stuff, and he's got a very big deadline. And uh, it, it turns out he's he's making some of that bubonic plague. 
Yeah. Not nice. Uh, we see Jane is being held hostage, and there's something at the door. She's tied to a bed in the basement, very similar to where uh, that cop was held. And then the smoke starts coming under the door, and it's Dracula with his vape pen. He's, like, vaping so hard in the other room, he's filling it with smoke. Vape life forever! That is one of two scenes that scared me when I was a kid. Nice, dude. When Dracula bursts in, it is awesome. It is so good. Oh, I love it. And really, what's really important about that was my vape joke. That was really good. Outstanding. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We cut back and we get Julian's amazing monologue, which the only thing more amazing than his monologue is when Peter Cushing bitch slaps him. I'm telling you, that was awesome. <laughs> and you could see Peter Cushing is so not a violent person and he does not want to hurt Freddie Jones. He slaps him so mm -hmm. light. It's like, whoosh, whoosh. Like he, he might have like blew his hair out of place with this wind <laughs> from his hand, but it's just so adorable. Peter it's Cushing funny. seems like a nice person. So yes, he's got some uh, petri dishes of various stages of mold growing in them. That's that's the plague. Julian gets suicided after a, a an assassin shoots Peter Cushing, grazes him on the forehead, and knocks him out. Was that his intention? I have no idea. He wakes up. Julian is hanging from the ceiling, and uh, all of the, the what I wrote in my notes is plaque samples. From from uh, teeth he was scraping to make the bubonic plague, because everyone knows that bubonic plague comes from your mouth. All the samples are gone. Meanwhile, I'm going to say meanwhile more, uh, Murray and the other guy go to the satanic home. And uh, Jessica, they're like, stay out of this, Jessica. She's like, yeah, right. She sneaks right in after them. And while they're interviewing um, Chin Yang, Jessica goes in the basement and uh, she runs into all the basement vampire ladies. The second scene that really scared me as a child. Yes, of course, of course, man. It's so very good. tense. It was it was tense when I watched it. Now there's like five of these women down here in very close quarters, mm -hmm. and they're all reaching for. Her, and every time she backs away from one, she runs into another, and then by just keeps doing that, it's until she has no room left, just on the floor, about to get eaten. But uh, Murray and his pal rescue her just in time. They all get out just in time without getting vampirized, and mm -hmm. that's time for soup. Then yes. Helsing gives them some soup. There you go, gentlemen. Very important. And uh, th they discover that a building downtown, which was built where that old church was, uh, is, is where uh, they think that uh, this rich industrialist landowner dude is, is living. And they strongly suspect he could be Draculia. I wrote in my notes, Bewero te 23rd, cloak is Tycano. I mean, the clock is ticking. So they know that on the 23rd that they're going to release this freaking bubonic plague. While sping on that hose, they owe it at Tamian. Silver bullet making channel sniper. <laughs> Dude, I think I fell asleep. <laughs> I oh my god. Oh boy. So. Let's just fast forward to when we actually meet. We get to see uh, Christopher Lee in his office as Dracula in his freaking uh, office with the light behind him uh, having a uh, little uh, sparring match, a, a mental sparring match with good old uh, Peter Cushing. It's like if this is the last time they're going to appear together in a, in a movie... Was this their last appearance in a movie or just in a Hammer movie? This is their last appearance in a Hammer film together. Okay. Because, dude, it is so great. This sequence is so awesome. I love it. Of course, he knows it's Dracula. And then... All right. <clears throat> Here we go. Ash for a GRE Lickupper Gold Sandwich Mother Swift Harsh Words Chin Yi Ira the We On Inspector Spainness, which could it could actually say Spaniards, but I'm not sure what this says. Spaniards save the do dog, save the dog. Now, Jennifer the Swoman, <laughs> and that's where my notes stop. <laughs> wow. Oh my God. Woo. Oh, I mean, you nailed it. I really, I really nailed it. So you did. 
he tries to unleash the plague, but it, it doesn't it doesn't happen. Dracula is being chased by Van Helsing into a hawthorn bush. Thank you, Wikipedia, mm-hmm. uh, where he gets entangled. Absolutely. And uh, because we learn from the movie, we add another one where Dracula, you know, can't stand crosses, sunlight, running water, as we learned. And also, mm-hmm. like, briar bushes? Uh, the hawthorn bush. Um, Van Helsing oh. explains that uh, that Jesus' crown of thorns was from the hawthorn That's bush. That's what it is. tree. That's what I said in my notes. Yeah. I mean, you read it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that that's, that's one of the things that this movie gets unfairly derided for. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the whole, is being different. It is very different. Because everyone says, yeah, everyone says, we want something different, not the same old stuff. And they do something different. Like, we hate this. Yes. Welcome to genre cinema hell. Yeah. You know, like, it's it's like why comic book movies are so screwed up all the time. <laughs> well, so they had made up the running water. And I don't know if that's, if that's from any kind of traditional vampire lore. I have no idea. But they did use that in... Prince of Darkness. Ah, okay. Where he tra- it gets trapped under the under the water. So then they use the hawthorn bush, but you know that's not what kills him. No, nope. I mean, you're not there yet. But nope. uh, that's something I think people overlook when they're talking smack about this film. He gets killed by a bush. No, he does not. Yep, yeah, because Van Helsing grabs a freaking uh, fence post, then mm-hmm. he breaks it off, and it's nice and sharp, and he drives it right into his heart. Yes, he does. And once again, we get Dracula turning to ashes, and then uh, Van Helsing retrieves his ring from the ashes now, and then, of course, abrupt ending as hell. Like, Boy. super abrupt. And it makes me- Freeze wa- frame. Yeah, it makes me feel like uh, I was watching a freaking, uh, an Italian horror film, uh-huh. uh, or a, a Hong Kong horror movie with that super abrupt ending. And I'm like, dude, melt that ring down. I think the ring is the problem. You may be right. <laughs> But that's most I of may the be plot. Crazy. That's most of the plot, except for all the stuff I skipped. Did you have any scenes that I totally glossed over that you wanted to mention, sir? When the secretary's in the room and Dracula comes in, that was always very tense when I was a kid. Yeah, uh, scared me. And then, of course, she smiles, and that adds to the creepiness of it. Nice. Um, and then when Jessica comes down the stairs and the secretary is in the foreground. When Jessica turns the light on, her eyes open. Uh, and that scene always, always creeped me out uh-huh. when I was a kid. There's something overall creepy about this film. I don't know. It's it's the idea of these people. I don't know. All these uh, prominent people that are into devil worship and into Dracula. And they're doing the making a plague. The fact that... In the opening scene, when uh, the spy breaks out, they're sitting right outside the gate, waiting for him while they're inside killing him. It is very much uh, an Avengers UK style uh, script and with Dracula mixed in. Uh, I think it makes an excellent sequel to uh, to Dracula 1972. You get more, uh, slightly more action out of Dracula this time. Uh, than you do in, in 80, 1972, as far as being out and about. He's, you know, at the house. He's at the, the high rise. Yeah. I've always really enjoyed this one a lot. I always take up for it because they did try to do something different. And, you know, it wasn't even released in America, like you said, until 1978. And then it was, re- you know, they couldn't say satanic rights of Dracula yeah. <laughs> in America. So it was Count Dracula and his vampire bride. And then as you heard... <laughs> In the in the the trailer TV spot that you played at the beginning of this, they're like Count Dracula marries the Queen of the Zombies. And then, <laughs> what? Really? Tell me more. Can you imagine? You're like, hey, Richard, I'm gonna go. Have you seen that new Dracula? Let's go see it. He marries the Queen of the Zombies, and you watch it. I'm like, this is <laughs> this is bullshit. <laughs> There's no Queen of the Zombies. Man, that's great. Uh, the, the working title for this was Dracula is alive and well and living in London. <laughs> uh, after the Jacques Brel album title. Oh, no, I don't know about that. Uh, Jacques Brel. I think that's Jacques Brel is alive and well and living in London. Nice. 
one of the people that are in thrall to Dracula, one of the old men, is Patrick Barr, Lord Carradine. And Patrick Barr, you will recognize from uh, two Pete Walker films. Ooh. House of Whipcord, which he's the judge. Holy shit. Um, yeah. And he is in the Flesh and Blood show. Nice. And I won't mention who he is. He is also in a James Bond film, so both of these films, outside of just Christopher Lee, who was in The Man with a Golden Gun, have James Bond folks. William Franklin that plays Torrance, that uh, that gets killed by the the sniper and the the guy. Yes, I've always I've always really liked him in this. He's a he seemed like a very dependable right hand man. The fact that the the people the the MI5 folks the guy that runs their entire department is one of the people that are in the conspiracy has always been kind of blood chilling <laughs> um so good but yeah no i've always really liked this one like i said it's public domain in america uh it actually went into production uh before 80 1972 was released 80 1972 did not do well in America, and so Warner Brothers said, uh, we don't want your other film. <laughs> so it wasn't until 1978 that somebody bought it and released it. I actually have. I ordered this from England. It is uh, the classic movie Monsters Collection, The Satanic Rites of Dracula, 1973. It's an exclusive deluxe collector's item edition, and it's from Nige Burton and Jamie Jones. They actually signed it, both of them inside, and numbered oh, it. It came cool. with a... A little mini poster. They're the guys that uh, that make the classic monsters magazine. It's nice, nicely bound, uh, glossy. It's got facts and trivia. It's it's just it's got a lot of really neat things in it. Cool. Uh, as Ted said, it is funny that somebody loved this film enough to make this super nice little little magazine tribute to it. That's amazing. Uh, and of course, I I love it as well. But yeah, it's got a quotable quotes, trivia. It goes through everybody that was involved with the film. And of course, Christopher Lee is like, I'm not, I'm not going to be Dracula anymore, so stop asking. And then he played Dracula one more time. It wasn't for <laughs> Hammer, and it was for a French film. Peter Cushing, I think, looks a lot more healthy in this one than he did in 80, yeah. 1972. Oh yeah, good call. Even though there's only a year between the two films in the cinematic timeline, we're actually two years later. Uh, which is interesting because I caught that uh, where Ben Helsing is talking about I battled Count Dracula two years ago, and I'm like, mm, that was last year. This is 73, well, but it takes place two years later. Time works differently in England. That is true. That is true. <laughs> one of the things I asked Alexa one time, what time is it in Preston, England? It came back with something about a, cl- a tongue and a clock. Oh, Hold yeah. on, let's ask her. <laughs> Alexa. What time is it in Preston, England? In Preston, it's 1.36 a.m. <laughs> Simon's probably not even in bed yet. <laughs> no, he's watching Twin Peaks. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what he's doing. God bless you, Simon. Hell yeah. I'd even let you say, Brad, what do you think about this film? I just blew Dude, no, you have to. You have to. No, I'm, I love this. this. Even though I was totally dozing off while taking notes. Uh, this is my second viewing. I saw it for the first time with Movie Party Crew when we did the, the double feature of uh, AD 1972 and then this one. And I think like you, I like this one a little more. Uh, awesome. It's just, it just hits the ground running and it's so much fun. And oh, man. It's just, it's got the creepitude. And like you said, it's got this, uh, the paranoia stuff with the, everybody's in on it and everyone's going to die. And uh, I love how it's not just Dracula making vampires. He wants to freaking destroy the whole world. He's finally had enough of human beings bullshit. It's so good. I'm trying to close the gaps on my hammer confusion because I, I mm-hmm. still, I still mix up some hammer films like I was talking about. Uh, but this is like a real bright spot for me. I, I never heard anything good about these, and I just kept avoiding this one because the public domain copies looked so bad. Oh yeah. And I just, I just didn't want to sit through another full frame, you know, pan and scan debacle. And so I just kind of held held off. And I'm really glad I did because finally seeing yes. this in widescreen and uh, it's just, it's so fun and so pretty. Love it. Amazing. Yeah. Well, folks, we're not done yet. Not, no, we're not. at all. We're going to do a, uh, a couple segments, including a question time, maybe more, but we'll be right back 
Hold on to your butts. Ready to castle, Captain, sir? Where you go? Where you there, go? Uh, two stone, six pound. Correct. Captain, sir, I'm breaking out the tea bags, sir. Stow them if they're not PG tips. Only these tea bags have the famous PG tips tea taste. PG tips tea bags for the tea you can really taste. The wind's coming up. Captain Epstein, duck! Duck? The seagulls. Oh! The Satanic Rites of Dracula, Question Time, and Real Talk with Brad segment. Three, two, one. Wow, 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 wow. So, Richard, I have a question time. What is a question? I don't even know. It's a prearranged something I've asked you. Yes. So, Richard, name three underrated or vampire films you like. See, you keep using the U word, you're going to hurt people's feelings. Well, I don't care. <laughs> That's what this is about. I, seriously, folks, I don't know why people hate the phrase underrated so much. Maybe it's because it's like uh, they're sick of spam and like clickbait. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, don't don't click on them. Yeah. I mean, there you go. Boom. Solved. So, yes, I picked three what I consider uh, underrated vampire films. Also, mm -hmm. three films I like. And I have a uh, a bonus runner up just for funsies. Same, same here. All right. Do you want to start? Or do you want me to start? You please start. Okay. My not included in the three. Um, Count Yorga. Mmm. I am. I am a big fan of this. Uh, this hippy dippy wonderfulness. Um, I like the sequel, The Return of Count Yorga, uh, mm -hmm. but it gets a little repetitive. Mm. It has a great sequence in it that's really scary at the beginning, but then um, it's one of those movies you just have on in the background, whereas I think... It's very hazy. Yes. <laughs> it's, all the, it's all the bongs they were smoking. But yeah, the, mm. the first Count Yorga film, Robert Quarry is, of course, uh, Count Yorga. Uh, I love that movie so much. Yes. I even bought one of the... I knowingly bought a freaking bootleg of it, in the guise of a real uh, Midnight Movies MGM set. When I got it, all of the MGM stuff was just missing from the artwork. <laughs> wow. Like, and you know, I don't know if I mentioned it, but Count Gorga is the reason they made these two films that we've been discussing. <gasps> no, no, you didn't. Uh, no, that... So, Count Gorga is, obviously, it's contemporary. It takes place in modern day right. times, which... And it was a success, so that's what gave Hammer the idea to bring Dracula into the present day. It makes perfect sense to me. Nice. My three films, uh, I'm mm -hmm. going to start with uh, something recent, very recent. I've talked about it pretty recently on the show, too. Uh, we didn't cover it, but I mentioned it. Uh, Vamp. Ooh. Uh, with good old uh, Grace Jones in it. Oh, man. Uh, I've not seen that. I mistakenly thought I had rented Vamp as a kid. I had not. So when I bl I accidentally blind bought the uh, the Blu-ray, the Arrow Blu-ray, and it's a fantastic Blu-ray. Oh my gosh! And I was watching Vamp for the first time and just couldn't believe it. I'm like, I have never seen this, but I love it. So folks, check out Vamp if you haven't gotten to it yet. Wow. And um, speaking of the 80s, I have uh, <laughs> uh, a movie I sort of apologize for. Uh, My Best Friend is a Vampire. Ah, uh, I don't think I've seen that one either. I remember when it was on TV, on cable quite a bit, so I'd seen little bits of it. Uh, but Lietta was a big fan of it. And so we bought it, and I love My Best Friend is a Vampire. It's... Uh, the worst part about it is it's got a, not the worst homophobic streak, but, uh, it gets pretty homophobic. <laughs> it's not, I'm going to go ahead and say it's not aggressively bad. It definitely hasn't mm. aged well in that regard. Uh, but it's just a wonderful, uh, teen comedy with, with vampire stuff in it. So I highly recommend you guys see that one. Just be forewarned of its, uh non-PC nature. Mm. And last but not least, um, a film that I have spoken to 
about with very few people. This one got buried. Uh, Levide or Livid. Uh, yes. Let's see, 2011? What year was that? Yeah, 2011, uh, directed by uh, Alexandre uh, Bustillo and uh, Julian Maury, or Maury. Uh, they did mm. in they did Inside, and I got this movie on. I think it might be a British DVD. You could not buy this movie in the states. I suspect you still can't buy this movie in the United States. They must have gotten a really shitty distribution deal. And actually, you know what? what the hell? Let's look it up. I love this movie. It is so good. And nope, you still can't buy this in the States. That is some bullshit. You know, I saw Levide, and it was a download, and I don't think... I don't think all the subtitles were there or something, because it it did not make any sense to me. <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> If you can find that old uh, that old DVD, oh, this says there's a Blu-ray, but I am skeptical. The Blu-ray is a Japanese Blu-ray, so yeah, that'll make more sense. I don't know why this is hard to find. It's it's just give it a look. How you know, beg, borrow, and steal. Find yourself a copy of Livid. Like I've seen it, and if you, I was surprised when you said it was a vampire film because I don't I don't even remember <laughs> it being a vampire film. It totally is. It totally is. I would say it's outside of the box. Yeah, well, yeah, nothing wrong with that. Okay, so uh, what are your uh, movies there, buddy? All right, so perhaps unsurprisingly, all of mine come from that magical decade of the 1970s. Yes. Uh, my honorable mention is somewhat of a cheat, but I would say the Bloodthirsty Trilogy. It's three films. I haven't actually seen the third one, but the first two are so good that it, it can't be that bad. <laughs> uh, they're... Uh, Japanese takes on yes. the traditional Western yes. uh, vampire. They're very much um, in a hammer style. Mm-hmm. I would highly recommend anyone check those Dude. out. I think it like $24 on Amazon for all three in wow. the nice little arrow set. You got me beat. I still haven't seen those. Really? I you have should. not seen any of those three. Damn. And then I've got... Lust for a Vampire, which is the unfairly derided uh, third part of the Cardenstein trilogy from Hammer. Nice. I don't remember if it's actually the third part or it might come in the middle. I'm not sure. People aggressively dislike this film. I think it's rather good. Uh, you've got buxom beauties that are vampires. It's a very dream, dreamy, kind of hazy film, kind of like we were talking about Count Yorga. Uh, highly recommended uh, if you've heard that it's bad and have avoided it. No longer do so. Deal. My next one is another Hammer film, which just happens to be my favorite Hammer film, Captain Kronos Vampire Hunter. Nice. Nice. Which is amazing. Yeah, it is. Uh, Absolutely. It's another different take on the vampire mythos. Uh, Had it done well, we would have seen Captain Kronos... Uh, across various time periods, sort of like Doctor Who, we'll just travel around, uh, killing vampires. Uh, these vampires don't, they don't feed on your blood, they feed on your youth. So it was a different take. It was, uh, uh the only film, uh, directed by, um, Brian Clemens, who, uh, was involved with the Avengers and the Watcher in the Wood and, uh, the thriller that I love, I love the UK. Uh, he wrote, and soon the darkness. Uh, highly recommended Captain Kronos. It's my favorite Hammer film, and that's really saying something. Nice. Carolyn Monroe is in it. And then uh, my number one underrated vampire film would be House of Dark Shadows. Yes, I almost picked that one as my runner up. Oh, man. God, it's so good. <clears throat> Basically, they take the Barnabas storyline and condense it into an hour and a half. And since it's not television and they're not just taking the first take, you know, there's no people bumping into walls or (laughs) scenery falling over. (laughs) And it's a lot bloodier than they could show on television. But it is so good. It is. I would highly recommend anybody that's in the 70s or vampires to check out House of Dark Shadows. I love it. I think it's just a tremendous film. Very atmospheric. It's so good. Lovely. But yeah, those are mine. Cool. 
Also, Good job, you. Yeah, you too. Also, thank you. Uh, vampires with a Y. Oh yes. Uh, the Hunger and Daughters of Darkness and mm-hmm. Lips of Blood. I mean, I could go on. I like vampire movies. Absolutely. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> but more importantly, Brad. Yes. Winnie, Winnie wants to get in on the action. You could hear her. Yeah, a little girl. We, and she's on the other side of the house. Oh, she just wants to be known. So, yeah, she's been asleep all day. <laughs> Folks, we have a segment that I love very much. We have not had enough of it. We're going to fix that tonight. It's a little bit we call Real Talk with Brad. Brad, what real talk are you going to do with us tonight? It's Real Talk with Brad. Wes Craven's later career is better than his early career. <gasps> Ooh, nice. The Devils doesn't have a domestic release. Stop pushing it on me. (laughs) Wait a minute. Are you talking about Ken Russell's The Devils? Mm Mm-hmm. I don't don't ever want to hear about that movie again. (laughs) There you go. It's real talk with Richard. Hey, yes, it's true. I have not seen it. And I know it's not fair for me to judge, so I'm not judging the film. I am not judging people who love that film. I am just so sick of hearing about it. And then Shudder got it, and the whole world exploded all over again. But I hear about three films in my feed between Twitter and Facebook. And all three are in my notes for Real Talk with Brad. Oh, my God. Every day, every day, someone talks about one of these three films, and it cracks me up, and I I want a gong that I can bang whenever I hear someone mention one of these frickin' movies and honestly i'd have to have a series of gongs because i'd go through gongs like i go through underwear which is i have one pair of underwear i wear it every day forever right inside out outside in upside down (laughs) on the loose (laughs) so brad what more do you got uh i'll throw out one more el caminante was gross and i only watched five minutes of it (laughs) Uh, this has been Real Talk with Brad. <laughs> we went through, we burned through a lot of them real quick there. Yeah, yeah Wes Craven. Three. Wes Craven, man, I I can't argue with your logic there. He, uh, nope, you and I are of the same accord. I am uh, just not that into The Hills Have Eyes. I, I do uh, kind of like it. Um, I will never sit through uh, Last House on the Left again, although I do, I do appreciate it for what it is. Um, obviously, Comedy Cops. Comedy Cops. The Hills Have Eyes 2 is, is a nightmare. Uh, and not a good kind. It made me puke when I was a kid, which is on my blog. You can find me talking about why that made me puke. I'll say this. I have never forgotten what Dear Nafa said about the Hills Have Eyes remake. Yep. That he, he did not have to watch any horror films for a while after that because it, it satiated his need. He, yeah, he didn't uh, watch horror for over a year after wow. he saw that. Yeah, that's how that's how much uh, that movie shook him. And I do like that remake, but I don't, I don't remake on Blu-ray. I think it's really good. Yeah, I don't want to sit through it again. I thought about having uh, having like a really intense movie thon with some Rob Zombie that maybe the Evil Dead remake. You know, basically try to try to just kill myself. But dude, you know what's really amazing? Ken Russell is the that? Devil's brother. Are you serious? <laughs> I've read, I have, I know so much about that movie. Like, I, I think it's, I got like a massive article about it in one of my books. So I just feel like I know it. So I haven't bothered watching it. And I've seen so many blog posts and like video reviews. I've just never seen it because I feel like I'm already inside it, brother. I don't see why they don't just release it on Blu-ray and let everybody, you know, I know you said it's on Shutter. Yep. Uh, my cousin Beth actually texted me and said, uh, the Devils by Kev- Ken Russell, which she's not one that goes on and on about. No, it. no, no. She just, <laughs> she just said that she had seen it and it was intense. Yeah, uh, and and that it was worth a watch, and I'm sure it is. It's Absolutely. Just, it's it's attained this this mythic status. Um, mm-hmm. It is kind of along the lines of Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, which has been voted the greatest movie of all time, was unavailable to see. For many years, wow. And while while I do think Vertigo is a great film, I wonder how much of its uh, unavailability fed into 
you know, the mythos it's, of the film. It's rep, yeah. And I'm just being stubborn about it now. Like <laughs> now that oh, I well, yeah. now that I never stop hearing about it ever because it just won't go away in my feed along with the other two well, films that we won't mention tonight. But like it's just I, so funny. Like I, I I now I'm just not gonna watch it just to be a dick. Well, and sometimes <laughs> the hype, like I'll tell you, yeah. Lovecraft Country it got really, really hyped. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't know that I want to see it. And you said it's really good, so I will see it. But sometimes it can just... And it's stubbornness. Well, and also, you, know? you, you watch things when you want to watch them. It's not being stubborn. It's checking your expectations. So if True. literally everyone you know is like, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. And so you forego your entire queue and you bump it up and... It's not what you thought it was going to be. It's going to mess you up. And I don't mean like emotionally, but you're not going to enjoy it as much as if you sat down one day and said, two years later, even, I'm going to watch the, you know, insert, you know, and and Lovecraft Country is a perfect example. Like, I mean, I didn't watch it until I got over how much it was going to cost to rent. Right. Because I didn't want to do HBO Max or HBO, whatever the hell. So I just watched it when I felt like it and it was great. But a lot of things get ruined because you've got everybody in your ear, mm-hmm. you know, saying, watch this, watch this, watch this. And so if you just hold out till you f- you're feeling it, then you get a lot out of it. I did that with, I'm trying to think of something I did that with where the hype was so huge. I waited like three years to watch a movie. And there's, I, I can't, there's lots of stuff that way. Yeah. I can't remember what the hell it was, but when I finally watched it, I was like, dude, this is good. And that's when I started to remember all the people who hated this movie because of all the hype. Mm-hmm. So you just you just do things at your own pace. Um, or like El Comandante, never watch it. Never. <laughs> never, ever. Well, somebody listening, somebody listening right now is saying they love Rob Zombie, but they're never going to watch The Devils. I'm never listening again. And hey. to you, I say, see you bye. <laughs> hey, there is no right or wrong with this stuff, man. Like, there's so many filmmakers that are this upper echelons of artistic you know they represent art you know they have all have their all their movies are on criterion Mm -hmm. whatever who cares like you're not a david lynch guy nope i've got no problem with folks that are i do like dune exactly i like dune dune's great and i'll tell you what did it and people can rail against me for this too Mm. elizabeth and i rented wild at heart Oh, yeah. And about about halfway through that film, I thought, David Lynch is just messing with the audience, his audience. <laughs> he doesn't care about me. I'm not going to care about him. Uh, but that's the thing. He keeps mentioning you in his weather reports. Well. He always does the weather in Los Angeles, and then he does the weather in frickin' uh, in Kentucky, brother. Al- Alberton. Yeah, Alberton. He's I- like, <laughs> the Alberton report. <laughs> yeah, I did like um, Lost Highway oh, back yeah. in the nineties. Mm, yes, uh, but a lot of that I think was the creepiness of Robert Blake. Oh God, that 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 whole that whole <laughs> that murder. <scene. laughs> yeah, great movie, great soundtrack. No, it, there there's directors that I know next to nothing about, and I'm just not curious about them. And they're you know they're considered to be masters of the cinema, and I'm just like meh. I'm trying to think of somebody off the top of my head. Um, well, I mean, also... Godard, I guess. Godard. Yeah, I'm not a Godard guy. No, no. You know? Uh, Truffaut, yes. Truffaut, I, I, what, you've said, what you've encouraged me to watch of Truffaut, I have really enjoyed. Like, you know... Uh, yeah, I think he's like he's got heart, whereas Godard, I just I don't feel any warmth. Yeah. But I would never, I would never attack anybody over them liking something. Exactly. I think everybody knows that as far as the show goes. We don't... Shit. We don't cover things we don't like, A. Mm -mm. And B, we've taken flack for liking things that, like, my soul to take and stuff like that, that I really do enjoy. We did Soul Survivors, so what, you know. We did. We did it. No, like, if I got, if I, okay, I I used to get angry. If I still got angry about people hating Rob Zombie, then I, I'm just going to hang myself. (laughs) <laughs> yes because he's just my guy like i he's got a permanent pass for me from me because he made freaking halloween too and it's my one of my favorite mm-hmm. films of all time so yeah that's all i think that uh 
people that should like the Lords of Salem have not given it the uh, a proper chance because it really is a Ken Russell film with Fulci and some Kubrick and some some uh, masturbating priests zombies. Well, I mean, or is that a spoiler? <laughs> I doubt it. Well, sir, thank you for getting real with us. That was amazing. You're welcome. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to get on my soapbox. Hell yeah. Folks, thank you for listening. And please uh, watch your neck around that Christopher Lee man. Protect your neck. Protect your neck. Cream. Get the money. Cash rules everything around my neck. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect Winnie moment. (laughs) Perfect Winnie moment. (laughs) Bye, folks. See ya. This is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is the Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still not